Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Podcast for the People. My name is Talon Pollock. I'm here with my father, my pastor, uh, my best friend, Matthew Pollock. How are you doing today? What a title. I mean, what a, not a title. What an introduction Intro? of some attributes. Doing great. Good to see you. It's always great to have these moments together. I love them. I love you. I love your shirt. That's a good shirt. Where, where would I find something like that? This was given to me um, through some friends who they go out and find um, like old shirts, vintage shirts, and they actually dyed this one. So it's like a one of one. Yeah. Like, if you want to wear it, I'll let you wear it. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. So it's, Thank that you. shirt's called The Find. Yeah. They found it. Definitely. That's impressive. Yeah. You feeling uh, good? You doing good? Your hair's growing out? Yeah. I'm kind of debating. Your beard, isn't, if I your should... beard is getting impressive. Oh, strong. thank you. Um, yeah. Just living life, you know? Come on. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, today's, of course, a new day when we talk about things that happen on Sundays, but I think when we were talking about what we wanted to um, discuss, it was something that you've been preaching, but also something that even if you weren't preaching it, that we'd both feel it. It's almost like a sense of um, all across the world, people are, are feeling kind of under attack in their faith. And I think now more than ever, um, people are struggling with their faith. People are questioning their faith. Um, and just... I mean, I've seen countless people even who have ins inspired me um, in what I feel like I've been called to do and um, leaders who were kind of, we label them as leaders in the faith and now kind of seeing them fall away from it. It's just really heartbreaking. And if they could fall away from it, anybody could fall away from it. Um, and I kind of wanted to just talk about that today is, is the theme and the topic of our faith and how it's being attacked and how... Now more than ever, we have to fight for our faith. Um, like Paul, that's what his life screamed, was faith is it's not a walk in the park. That Every day he has to fight for it. Um, but do you feel that? Could you see that in this day and age of, of everything that's going on, that we're being swayed to the left and to the right? And it's not even just a younger generation. That It's, it's kind of everybody who's living right now. Yeah. I, I, um, I agree wholeheartedly with your beautiful display of introduction. It just seems in my short years of life that I've never seen it appear that the attack, the questioning, the instability of people and their faith is at an all-time high. And I think it is appropriate and it is applicable and it is applicable that you and I sit and discuss what's really under attack is the fundamental values of people's faith, what they believe, why they believe. And it just seems like you said, it's all across the board, Talon, from mature ones who we would think are established and rock solid to other ones who may not know better and in our dialogue, uh, I have begun to kind of preach on it. But this is, like you said, beyond a message of preaching. This is a talk that we need to discuss. I was a little bit unaware of it, but you have a better sense of culture sometimes than me. And I like kind of filtering things through you. You have a pulse and a touch on things. And you begin to bring to my attention some global world-class world leaders who God used to accomplish great things. And how now they're shipwrecking, um, for sake of a scripture, uh, typology, their faith. Where do we even begin? Um, I, I don't know. I guess let's begin big and work our way small, if I could. Yeah. You want to go ahead? Want if you something? had something to say, I, I don't want to cut you off. Did you have something to say? If, if I could, I, I guess um, Jesus uh, in Luke 18, I think, is a, um, is a good place that has... I have this in my notes. I haven't got to it quite yet. I hope to get to it in a Sunday to come. Jesus says that upon his return, which his return is imminent, uh, we could be, you know, the generation that sees it. Our world, as we speak today, the Amazon rainforest, 
Russia, Montana had hail storms. Mom, uh, Abby was sharing with me yesterday that killed 21,000 birds. I don't know how they count that. Like our world is in travail. Our world is in chaos. His return is imminent. His return is imminent, and it appears now that it is sooner than, than later to us. But Jesus gives us some insight, some gravity, some handles. And he says that upon my return, it, it describes what he'll be looking for. It describes what he'll um, measure. But it also, to me, describes the underlying attack. And he says this, Luke 18.8, 8, upon my return, Will the Son of Man really find faith? If you break that down, what he's saying is the thing he's looking for is faith. Then it would, then it would, then it would make sense to say that then our faith is going to be under attack. And in essence, what Jesus is saying is that the world will be in such a state that real, genuine, authentic, alive faith will be rare like a rare breed, like that shirt is rare, it'll be hard to find people really in faith, trusting, believing, and responding to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sobering. The Antichrist spirits that are opposing everything of truth and of value that requires faith. Let's face it, faith is required. It is impossible to please God without faith, and faith is an action. Faith is a response. It'll be rare. So, yeah, we see it. It is everywhere. People in the church and out of the church. Yeah. And I think addressing it in a way where we're not, like, attacking people who are struggling with their faith. Because there could be people who are listening right now who they have no idea what to think. Or um, not just, like, saying, oh, you're you know, abandoning your faith, because it's, it's not, I don't think anyone would just abandon their faith. I think it's more so we start to ask a lot of questions. And I think that if, if our faith is based off of how many of our questions are answered, then our faith life is going to be very short. Yeah. Um, because there's something about Jesus and, and um, I wouldn't say there's something about our faith in Jesus that is very different and puzzling to us. Um, a lot of the times when Jesus was approached by the Pharisees, they would ask for a sign. Yeah. They would ask for tangible proof yeah. of something to that they can see that would prove God's existence yeah. and would prove that he is the Messiah and... Um, every time he would just, he would say, you know, you twist a generation, like you're looking for a sign. But yeah. I think that he took that Jesus almost, he didn't get offended, but he took that to heart because he understands that how his, how it works between heaven and us is faith. Yeah. And it's, if we have to get proof of everything, then there's no requirement of faith. So good. And I think that like, let's settle this now for believers and for people who are um, embarking on this journey of, of being a Christian and following Jesus is that you're not going to have all your answers, your questions answered. Ever. And I feel like if you go into it like that, it's going to take a lot of stress off of your life. Um, I know we have to, we feel the need to like figure everything out, but yeah. sometimes God's just saying, do you trust me? Do you believe in me? Do you have faith that I am who I say I am? And I feel that that moves his heart more than, yeah, let me show, let me prove myself to you. Like God doesn't want to have to prove himself to everybody. And um, so just addressing those people, it's often it starts with a question. Mm. Well, if God is real, then why is this this way? Or why is that that way? And um, I've been watching like a lot of debates on, you know, even just YouTube of, of preachers and how they'll, you know, go out into the community and, and evangelize. And um, a lot of these people that they're, ta they're talking to are very smart people. They're very knowledgeable. And for some reason, it's almost like this, not saying to be a, a Christ follower, follower, you have to be stupid, but it's almost for the people who aren't as scientifically or, or whatever smart, they have a better time 
uh, an easier time having faith to whereas the people who are more intellectual, it's almost like, man, I need an answer. I need, it's almost like a roadblock, which isn't bad. Um, but I think just how, how would you kind of, because I know you're not like a science major. I know you're not, um, you didn't go to college. Um, all you have is faith, you know? Um, how would you say we can speak to people who are questioning a lot of those big questions? It's almost hard to contain myself. I just feel that. I mean, what you're saying is so relevant, and it was a, it's a beautiful archi- uh, articulation of what you're saying. I don't even, I almost feel like I got fireworks inside of me yeah. before you even approach it. Um, you're right. Faith is not circumstantial, and it's not carnal, and it's not fleshly. Faith is spiritual. You have to come as a child. That's the difficulty with this thing, with, with God. You cannot, you will not understand it all. It's the mystery. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, one of the most imperative understandings for this generation, because they are savvy, intellectual. They are being educated at an all-time high. The astuteness of this generation is off the charts, which could complicate our faith because we're trying to comprehend God through our understanding, through our mind, through our carnality. But the things of God are only spiritually discerned. They're foolishness of the flesh. So one of the maybe the most applicable things to this generation, and I mean everyone at the sound of my voice, is in Isaiah 55, it says this so clearly. God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Friends, you'll never understand what you don't understand. Why are there sick kids? Why is there the poor? Why would a loving God, X, Y, and Z, you know what, Talon? I don't understand it. I don't need to understand it. And faith isn't asking me to understand that. It's asking me to put my trust in a perfect God, in a perfect Savior whose ways are higher and whose thoughts are higher. It would almost seem with sexuality, all the questions that this generation has, here's the answer. You won't understand it. You're not supposed to understand it. God does not think like we think. And his ways are not our ways, so we have to get beyond our understanding, out of our imperfection in this fallen worldly realm, and put our faith in him. That's why God gave you like a life preserver in an ocean. You'll drown without it. Put your faith in him, yeah. looking unto Jesus. Put it in, the, in, in his face. So would you agree? They're trying to understand and make sense of something that you will never make sense of. Yeah. And I, I love what you're saying about how faith is, is spiritual. And if you're not, if you don't focus on your spiritual life and pursuing God spiritually, I mean, f- I've never seen God. Yeah. I've never seen. Nor have I, right. I've never seen him show a sign and wonder. And if people are only operating out of their flesh looking for that, it's going <laughs> to. No, no, you're right. You're hitting it. If you're looking for that, I promise you, I would say this, you'll be fooled by the enemy. Mm. With, with, if you're looking, and, he, and you hit, I like what you said. It's a, Jesus said he spoke to the generation, and he said, you faithless generation, you're always looking for a sign. Yeah. If you're looking for a sign, trust me, there are many signs out there that the God, little g God of this world, will show you to try to disprove, create a question, um, sever your faith, and create doubt. Yeah. I was reading a statement the other day. It seemed like it struck a chord. I sent it out in one of our staff group texts and on my social media. I don't, didn't get to get to it preaching, but it was so cool. It says, your faith can move mountains, but your doubt can create them. Mm. And it's so true. Uh, the enemy is the mastermind at creating a little leaven of doubt, disbelief. Well, if God was good, then why did that happened and why was I raised that way and why again we don't understand we can't go there it's a spiritual reality it's a place that that God gives us a measure of faith that we have to grow and develop it will never be naturally or carnally or fleshly discerned but it's like we have so many people now because we've gotten almost so smart like the Tower of Babel we've almost explored realms we shouldn't have and got behind the veil 
It's like you, you being raised in our home. Uh, you didn't know a lot of things until you got of age. Now you're at the age of 21. Now you know cost more and you know more about life. But it wasn't time until it's time. But if we get behind the veil before it's time, it actually can create this sense of doubt. And I think we have a lot of people that once maybe believed or had that childlike, I believe, God's good, now have created mountains of doubt, strongholds, strongholds of doubt that have created these mountains. And the enemy and signs in the world we live in has created this massive sway to get us away from the fundamental values of our faith. Like we're questioning marriage. We're questioning the church. We're questioning God's goodness. We're questioning connection. We're questioning these things that are rock solid because these doubts have infiltrated. Does it really matter? Why do I believe what I believe? Yeah. And I think you should know what you believe, but only through not the feelings, not even the facts, Talon, but the truth of Scripture. Yeah, and I think that's what I exactly wanted to hit on is that God's truth is all truth. And that everything that God does is, like, it says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Wow. He, he not only speaks truth, he is truth. Wow. And for us to oppose his truth is to oppose all truth. And I feel yeah. that if so we have a no, faith. There, no, hold on. That, so there is no truth outside of his truth. No. So then what are we trying to build on? Exactly. So that's why I think it says the beginning of all knowledge is the fear of God. Wow. That. You, it, I don't care how smart you are f- in the physical world. If you don't have this one fundamental fear of the Lord, that's like, to God, that's the beginning. Like, that's the basic. But for so many of us, it's so hard. And touching back on the truth thing, I feel that um, everyone, everyone tries to build their life off of their own truth. And that's a very secular thing. That's all they have to build and se- off of. Sexual and sensual. And sensual. But it's creeping into the church now yeah. because it hasn't been addressed. And I feel like a big thing in faith and to live a life of faith is to live a life of submission and surrender. And if we're never willing to surrender our what we think is our truth to God's truth, of course we're always going to question because we'll only want to believe what we believe is true. Um, so when you ask questions like, well, why does the Bible say this? I don't necessarily believe in that. That's not necessarily my truth. And it's God operates in a way where it's 100% his truth or nothing. So good. It was never apply six out of the 10 truths that I say and you'll make it. It's, it's all in or, or nothing at all. And I feel that um, in this generation, there's people who believe and there's people who know that there's a higher power and know that there's something bigger out there but they don't want to submit to the truth by faith that we believe has been entrusted to us and I feel like that the first step is surrender the first step to living a life of faith is understanding like okay maybe I don't understand why it's this way, yeah. but I can trust in, in God because yeah. he's truth. And, and, and that's the, you're always on point, but you feel like you're sharp today. You, you must have had a good, a good breakfast. A good, did you drink coffee today? I did. What was your coffee? I actually woke up at five to go work out. So I, I, I knew, I knew there was something special. So that's the secret. <laughs> you're on point today. Let's just get to the simplicity of it. Like who at the sound of our voice or who living now, like, since where did it come that you will understand and have to agree with everything? You said it, submission. I don't know why we feel like we have to be in agreement to agree. Like, it's different. Yeah. You know, and, and God didn't create this world that you'll say you agree with everything. God created it by his wisdom, by his knowledge, by his understanding. So yeah, I, I've said this for years and years and years, and it seems maybe it's more important now than ever. If you want to follow Jesus, which the greatest decision you can make is to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, serving him and pursuing him and building your life upon the rock and not the sand, you will have to live beyond your understanding. 
and the vehicle, the mechanism, the ecosystem of the kingdom is the vehicle of faith. So I don't have to be, because if you want to live by your own understanding, you will be paralyzed in your past. You'll be paralyzed in what you don't know. You'll be paralyzed in hurt. I just left a woman's uh, family member's house praying for a 50-year-old man on life support, on bed rest. He served the mission in L.A. He was a part of the Union Church there. And then she asked me to go upstairs to pray for a friend up there. I walk in there. I start to pray for her. And I just felt the word of knowledge come to me and, and pray for her broken heart. Last year, her four-year-old child felt, felt dead. Felt, felt dead. So she's sick in bed of a heart. She's broken, heartbroken. Now she has all these symptoms. Listen, life is not fair. Uh, life doesn't always make sense. You mentioned Paul's fight of faith, the challenge. The only way to, to not be paralyzed to this life is to live beyond our understanding through the vehicle of faith. And here's what I'll say. I don't have to understand it all to believe him and to sing to him and to trust him. And you know what? I don't want to understand it all. Yeah. I don't have the capacity to. So you got to get yeah beyond what you don't understand and put yeah let your faith rest can i say one more thing i want you to go because you i love the angle you're coming at jesus steps into there's a there's a um jairus daughter there's a ruler a synagogue rich ruler in scripture in in the gospels in jesus's day and he's got a daughter by the name of jairus and she follows false dead everyone's mourning they're preparing a funeral service and they ask Jesus to come in, and he clean, cleans the room out, brings faith in there. And But Jesus says something like this. In essence, your daughter's not dead, and he says this. I love this. Only believe. And I think we've got to be careful if we believe and add all these other things. Only believe. Only. Meaning have your faith clean. Have it purified. He says only believe. Don't get caught in all the other things of this generation. Yeah. And what I was going to say is I feel for us as as people in the thousands of generations before us, even till now, is we all are looking for a direction. Um, and before it was dictated through philosophies from very profound thinkers and um, for people who almost would think in a way that a whole generation could, okay, that makes a little bit of sense. I can follow that. Um, but that's that's kind of the opposite of, of what faith is. It's not a philosophy. It's it's are you willing to put a, a blindfold on and walk out in the dark and trust that I'm God and that I can provide. And I feel now more than ever, everyone has their own philosophy. And through Instagram and through social media and, and through this content driven life and we are constantly consuming. I feel like there's always a need to put content out and there's always a need to feed on it, you know? Like can we even get ready without watching a YouTube video or listening yeah, to so something? Uh, I was catching us. myself the other day. I'm like, why am I trying to put something on right now? Like I can I can just sit here and, and think for myself for a little bit. Almost avoiding and afraid of silence. Yeah. And now more than ever, there's so many versions of what God's called to be only one version. There's no, he, I think he's very clear. He's very precise. Um, and we feel that we have to live in this age where we have our own version of it. And I kind of wanted you to kind of just speak to that because maybe the church hasn't done a well enough job of saying, this is how it is, you're either in or out. And that sounds offensive, that sounds not attractive, but I'm almost at a place now where it's like, out of the hundred people that listen to that, if three take it away and they win. apply it to their life, it's a win. I agree. I would rather have those three people than all those, all the hundred fe people feel, okay, this is okay. Like, I feel that us in our church and our in our ministries, we have to move beyond just this message of, of grace, saying all God says about you is that he loves you. And I feel like that's, 
Jesus' ministry was repent, much like John's. And nobody's preaching repent anymore. And it's not for the sake of changing people. It's for the sake of helping people's lives. Because I'm sick of seeing these people who, there's, it's almost like a gray area of Christianity when there's no such thing in God's eyes. And calling it back to what it is and what it isn't. And for people out there, like, we can't make up our own version of Christianity. We can't make up our own version of what we feel or what our truth is of following Jesus. The Bible is the Bible. That's what God's given us and the Holy Spirit. And I feel like we're, we aren't preaching that enough of the exclusivity of what it really is. You know what I'm saying? Like, when's the last time you've seen a message so clear-cut of repent of that, turn away from that, this is how it is, a clear line. I feel like nobody's addressing those clear lines. Everybody's saying stuff that will make everybody just feel good. And when you, you said it, when Christ comes back, how many of us believers even live in faith at all? Because there's our faith in him, but then there's also faith for more in our own lives. And it says he's coming back to look for people who still have faith. And it's almost us as a church, not like specifically this church, but the church in whole, are we even like preaching that, you know? It's like a scary reality of everyone's an evangelist, which is great, but there has to be more than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I feel like If you can kind of help me out, I'm running out of things to say, but um. I know. Um, uh, I, I know that 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 is a uh, the temptation is to appease and please people yeah. at the sake of possibly pleasing God, because sometimes you can't do both. Yeah, and what upsets me the most is there's predominant leaders in in Christianity. And when they're asked a very clear-cut question, it's never a clear-cut answer. It's always this fluffy cloud of, this is how I'm going to answer that so that I don't offend anybody or I don't stir the pot. And I'm just like, how is that going to help somebody who's on the verge of, man, I need to know if this is right or wrong, if I should, con- should continue in this? For that, that could be life or, or death for some people. And I couldn't agree more. I, I, I mean, you're 20. I couldn't agree more. I'm so glad at 21, you're, I guess, at least aware of it. I think the scary part is some may not even be aware of it. Yeah. We're just in this haze, this cloud. We're just, I know, I know. I think it does come back to the pulpit and it does come back to the church because Paul said the church in Timothy is the pillar and ground for all truth. And we have a mandate to uphold truth. Yeah. To uphold truth, whether you like it or not, you know, like I'm not here to be your best friend as a pastor. I'm here to watch out for your soul yeah. and to make sure that your soul stands before the Lord in a healthy manner. You don't lose your soul for this world. And it is. Yeah, there's different dimensions of it. But I think like never before, we need preachers of righteousness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness for the salvation of his family who stand for truth and say your faith is under attack. That is the sway. That's a different voice. That's not the voice of your shepherd. That is another voice. Sounds like it. But if you it, it, you got to know Jesus. you got to press in. And I've been in this whole vein. And I can get so passionate about this now. I want to shout at the rooftops. Not that I have the answers, but you just feel that call of John, that call crying out saying, hey, don't draw back. We're not those who draw back. You know better. You have come further. You've seen God has built your faith. You've done great things like the children of Israel leaving Egypt and God parting a Red Sea and leading them by a cloud by day and fire by night, feeding them with manna, yet they still doubt and question and almost want to go back. It's like, no, go back to what? And we've come so far as a people, and now people are in this place, valley of decisions, almost saying, I'll rather go back. Go back to that life, and it's just we need clear-cut truth, calling people by faith to a place of repentance, a place of action, a place of clear-cut commitment and value, and a place that we can live in that place of truth. So 
I don't know that I, I don't have all the answers. I want to steward my influence and my, the microphone, so to speak, and my um, assignment as best as I can. And not truth in this dogmatic, religious way, but truth going, there's more for you. And yeah. God has victory for you. And there is freedom in Jesus. And so. Yeah, it's, we're not doing our job if we're only giving partial of the truth that we know. Wow. And I guess my whole thing, because there's the good news of Jesus is that he loves us, that he paid the debt that we could never pay ourselves. He's given us, he is the greatest gift that any of us could ever receive. We couldn't do it on our own. We are, it says that even the good things that we think we do outside of Christ is of filthy rags mm. to God, mm. meaning that Without Jesus, we aren't even close to anything that God has commanded or, or, or called for our lives. And knowing that Jesus is for everybody, that it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter the life that you live, that he's ready and he's available. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's not enough just to believe in him. It's, yeah. It says put your faith and trust in in Jesus yeah. every day. And make that daily choice and decision. Yeah. It's a choice. It's a decision. There's a very sober thing, like you're saying, that in Hebrews 4, it says, like to us, to them, the word was preached to them. But because they didn't mix it with faith, they didn't choose, they didn't even enter in. And you're right. It's like, yeah, you took a step to Jesus. We, we, he is king of all kings. Paul says to the king, eternal, immortal, invincible, the only God. But we can almost, without responding to him yeah. and making that choice to him, we'll never enter in to the fullness that he has. And how many people are paralyzed right now, stuck right now? Um, immature, premature babies because they haven't made that daily dedicated choice and decision. James says it this way in the Message Bible, faith without works is dead, or it's a dead dog that stinketh. Yeah, it, it, It's a dog that has deceased in your home, and your faith is, is rancid when you don't use it. And there's a lot of people in church listen to podcasts, singing the latest, greatest songs, and their faith stinketh. Mm. It's like a dead dog that has deceased in your home and you haven't cleaned it out. And everyone can smell it, <laughs> but you. Faith without works or corresponding action, action is dead. Yeah. And I love what, I just want to give like some confidence to our leaders and to our preachers is, I love of Hillsong Church, Robert Ferguson. He, he had this quote that said, after I'm done preaching, I will always, my goal is to offend you. Oh. And he says that. Come on, Robert Ferguson. He says that you will be offended, and but it's how we respond to the offense. It either offends our sinful or nature, makes us change. and we make us change, or it offends us in a stubborn way where we turn away. And I'm just here to say, like leaders, like that your job is to speak truth, and of course through love. But it is us as people, and that's every. Everyone has that decision because everyone's going to be offended by the nature. The gospel of Jesus is offensive it's to offensive. every human being because we are flesh. You're right. You it, are going to be offended. He's the chief cornerstone that caused others to stumble. So you're right. But the thing is, is like we either take that and change or we, in our sinful nature, we say, no, we don't want it. And, and that's so beautiful. Gosh, I, I, I mean, I'm stirred that you at 21 are calling for that. That's powerful. And thank God for people like Robert Ferguson's and the other 7,000 prophets that God says haven't bowed their knee. You know, Elijah thought he was the only one. He goes, I got 7,000. Thank God for that. And Lord, help us do that. But didn't Jesus every, in every moment leave them with a decision? You stay or you come follow me. You either stay rich, rich young ruler, or you sell it all and come follow me. You either let the dead bury the dead or you come follow me. Yeah. If you, you know, what is, uh, Luke says, if you, uh, if you handle the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Didn't he yeah. always leave them with this intersect of a decision, yeah. what you're doing, where you're going? And we probably should have preaching that doesn't just tickle all our ears and make us feel emotionally yeah. good, leaving us in a place of bondage, but says, hey, Come follow me. What are you yeah. doing? What decision are you making? Because Jesus believed in it so much. 
and we're afraid that, you know, even if it's truth, don't say it because that person's going to take it the wrong way. Where Jesus was begging people, I dare you to leave right now. So like, good. if you don't, if you don't want to so follow me, feel free to go. <laughs> I mean, and I've, people think Jesus was all love and all truth wrapped in one. And yeah. he's the most influential Christian figure. Of course, he's God. Yeah. But just think about that. Yeah. That you can be all love and all truth, and I don't think that the two can escape each separate. other. Yeah, yeah. It's you can't attention. have truth without love, and yeah. you can't have love without truth. Because I love you, I give you truth, and because there's truth, I, I love you. Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah, it's so I, I'm loving this. This is my favorite podcast thus far, not just because it's our latest one and newest one, but yeah. I love what we're talking about here. Do you agree, Dylan Brown and Paloma? Come on, team. We got a great team here who worked so hard helping us do this. Shout out to all the amazing heroes, nameless and faceless people. Um, yeah, he was so radical. I mean, I, I've said this for years, and I don't hope this is too spooky or even like I would have a theological sense on the mark of the beast, 666, but John 6, verse 66, I've always kind of thought that. It says that there was a people just got done, he just got done feeding them, that they walked with him, and they walked with him no more, and they left, and then he responds and says, hey, who else wants to go? Like, how do we respond to the church today? No, no. no. But he was so <laughs> radical and convinced. Yeah. Where else are you going to go? Yeah. And and they they were walking with him, which is, let's just make a, a, a footnote here. The whole plan of the enemy is to get you to stop walking with him, clearly. And, and he then, the next verse, our statement says, hey, guys, people are leaving. They, they didn't want to, they didn't, it got too hard for them. It was too much for them. And he goes, who else wants to go? And it's like, that's almost how strong and secure Jesus was. We, though, flipped this around going, I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to be likable. I yeah. want to be popular. I want to have a blue check mark. I want to, but really, like, it may be you, you may, standing for him, may create people to, you may be polarizing. Yeah. And I, I think that's because people need that. And, I feel like... Even, but it's just not popular in the world today. No, not at all. And that's resulting in people who are wavering every single day. Because, and I'm sure there's wonderful churches out there who do do that. But I'm just saying that we as a whole can do better. Because people's lives are in the balance. People, the, the, an absolute truth isn't being preached. So everyone feels that they have the right to whatever they believe and however I can fit God into that, it's good. Yeah. And people's lives are being destroyed. Yeah. Christians, we should be the we should be the example to the world. Yet us as of course the Christians are aren't perfect, but I don't know. It's just I saw this statement. I th I thought it was a preacher. It may have been an athlete or somebody, and I referenced it a couple weeks ago, and the statement was, I'm offended that you got offended. <laughs> and it was like yeah. they reversed it, like, because everyone is offended now, and the guy's like, I'm offended that you're offended. Yeah. You know? And it, you almost kind of, you kind of turn the table on it going like, yeah. welcome to the club. Like, I'm offended yeah. that you're offended, you know? And this just calls for a higher level of, if you're a preacher and if you're, if you're a follower of Christ, you need the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. 100%. Because if the Holy Spirit's flowing through you, that's not on you. If the person doesn't yeah. bite, if the person doesn't maybe get influenced in the way that you wanted to, at least you're knowing like it wasn't out of my flesh that I tried to witness or, yeah. or tried to be an example to this person. It was yeah. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, people deny Jesus. Of yeah. course, they're going to deny you. That's right. But that doesn't mean that we change that's right. our truth. We change our what God's called us to do because ultimately we're trying to turn people in a different direction. And maybe we go here. You're, you're saying it, you're kind of pulling out of me. We've almost focused on becoming more cute, more appealing and, and focused on structures and system that will appeal to the masses. Yeah. Which Jesus wasn't trying to fit in. Right. No. Then saying, I want life transformation. And I want to, you know, it, and I don't know the tension. I haven't mastered it. I, we certainly grapple with it all the time. But it's almost like we have diminished our core values to appease a generation that doesn't even know what they want or need. And I've always said this. God will give you what you need. 
before he'll give you what you want. And what you'll find out is what I needed is ultimately what I wanted. Yeah. And if we keep giving people what they want, they'll never get what they need. Yeah. And it keeps him in that place. And then maybe one thing that'll let you feel how you want to close it out. But it's a profound thought that I have been regurgitating on lately. In John 6, Jesus is approached and they asked him, what are the works of God? You could use that as signs. Uh, how do we materialize? How do we measure? There's a word. What is the, um, uh, the, there's a word I'm looking for. It may not come to me now. What is the, you know, measurables of God? And Jesus says this in, in John 6, that the work of God or the greatest work of God is that you believe, meaning the greatest thing that God does or the greatest work of God isn't the sun, the moon, the stars, our beautiful ocean. The greatest work God does is create a belief and a faith in a human heart. Wow. That's great. Um, so, yeah, we kind of we kind of touched on a, a broad subject of faith and even just a call to standing firm in what we believe as believers. But I would just encourage people out there that if you're struggling with your faith, that, you know, you're not alone. Um, a lot of people have doubted and a lot of people have questioned and that that's okay. Like our faith is always being tested. Um, but just know that God is who he says he is, that you can trust in a world that's taught us to, we have to understand everything. We have to um, figure everything out. Jesus is, he's so beyond what we could ever even comprehend or understand. And just rest in knowing that he is who he says he is and um, that the Holy Spirit, he, he's coming to give you answers and he's coming to help you. And um, it simply says in the Bible that if you seek, you'll find him. And we can't expect to find God if we're not pursuing him. And that's the first step of, okay, God, I know I'm never going to fully understand you, but if I pursue you, maybe I'll... I'll I'll get a glance of, of who you are and what you do. And I, I know personally for my life, that's all it takes. Um, and I know for you that he can prove himself to you through his love, through his mercy. And, but just walking with that faith, knowing that he is who he says he is and you, I can trust in him. And um, just a call to all of our preachers and all of Christ's followers, because you don't have to be a preacher to reach other other people is, of course, God's commanded us to love all people, and that's that's our posture is love, but um, there's no truth. There's no love without truth, and there's no truth without love, and um, we are called to love everyone. The good news of Jesus is that the kingdom of heaven wasn't exclusive anymore. Jesus was taking his ministry into places that religious people um, were too afraid to go, didn't think the people there deserved it, didn't even give them a chance. Um, but Jesus was truth in flesh, and he brought that to everyone that he saw. You know, I think about um, the woman who was about to be stoned. And um, Jesus, of course, he prevented that. And he's done that for us, where we have discerned, deserved the worst of the worst. Jesus steps in. But I love what he says at the end is he says, go, but sin no more. And um, that's just a perfect balance and reflection of there's no love without truth and no truth without love. And that's what we've called to do. We've called to bring the, the good news of God, but the full truth of God. Um, because we're not helping anybody if we're holding back a piece of the message that Jesus has called us to say. Would you agree? A hundred percent. Beautifully said and articulated. Mm. Uh, I think you should pray for them. I think you should call them back to our convictions, call them back to God's house, call them back to truth, call them back to what they know. I think we should call them back. The whole book of Hebrews is calling people back to a place. And let me tell you this. Jesus, your love for Jesus is incomplete without your submission and faithfulness to his house and to his family and wow. to his body. Don't detach yourself from the body. Amen. That's a lie from hell. Yeah. You're not complete with Jesus without his family, Outside. his bride. Yeah. Amen. So we're just going to pray. Um, thank you, Father, for whoever's listening, whether it's through the podcast app or even through YouTube, God, as they're watching this. I pray that 
um, this time that it pulled people closer to you. God, I pray for people who are struggling with their faith, who are struggling if you're real, who are looking for a sign, looking for anything, God. I pray that you would just speak to them in their heart, that you would show them who you are and what you do, God, and just give us the courage to have faith because it takes courage to um, submit to maybe something that we can't see or something that we can't hear, but you're more real than the air that we breathe, God. So I pray that you would bring people back closer to you, that we would stop swerving to the left and to the right. Father, I pray that um, as the world screams louder and louder, that our voice for you would just over overtake the what the world is saying, God, that our voice would still be strong in this day and age, that people wouldn't be afraid to speak truth, that people wouldn't be afraid to pro- proclaim the gospel that you've commanded us to preach. So, Father, we just pray for everyone listening that they would be blessed, that they would be... Um, Father, just... Show us how to live for you and show us what to do and help us to have an open heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's, or month, I should say, this month's episode of Podcast for the People. We pray that um, it touched you. If you want to share it with your friends, feel free to do that as well. Um, If there's anything that we could ever do for you, uh, follow us on Instagram at The Way Family Church. And we'll try to do our best to make your life better. We'll see you guys next time. Have a great week.